Michael Cohen's testimony super anticipated. What was the atmosphere like? Well, it was pretty tense to begin with, and I think uh, Michael Cohen himself had a bit of jitters, but he calmed down pretty quickly. And as we got through the day, I think his testimony got more and more striking and more and more important. I mean, especially towards the end of the day, you know, he provided the link that we had not yet heard, which was to bull Trump into the scheme and to say that basically Trump knew kind of all three elements of what the DA's case is, right? That Trump knew that the reimbursement scheme was to pay back hush money, that Trump knew or was kind of causing these uh, false entries to be made into the Trump organization's books. And then most importantly, Trump signed off and gave his approval with Michael Cohen, Alan Weisselberg in his office in January 2017. Uh, to put together this sham cover story about how, you know, he was going to be the personal attorney and all of this was going to be paid as legal expenses. Jeremy, so I have a thing when I talk to the lawyers and I'm in that chair, I take my glasses off and we talk I'll, straight, I'll straight. All right. So we talked earlier and you mentioned the notion of diminishing returns as a possibility for Cohen being on the stand for too long. Number one, explain to our audiences what that actually means. And number two, do you think that that's something the prosecution is still worried about at the end of day one? Absolutely, because you have to move your case forward. And the longer that someone <clears throat> like him is on the stand, the more opportunity there is for him to go rogue, to go off the sort of path and, and go his own way and say things that could really be damaging and damning and set up for more impeachment. And that's more opportunity for the defense to cross him and expose the holes, expose that prejudice, expose that, that angle that he wants revenge. So the longer he's there, he, his value starts to go away because it starts to expand well beyond the four corners of this is a falsified business records case. Let's not make it into something it isn't. MSNBC legal analyst Andrew Weissman wrote a piece for the New York Times where he said basically he's questioning whether Michael Cohen even needed to be called by the prosecution. What are your thoughts on that? I, you know, I, I would disagree to say someone he should not, because that fact that he would not be there would leave so much up for speculation. And like we, we would like to believe that the jury will 100 percent follow the judge's instruction. We know, as people, common sense tells us there's going to be that in the back of the mind. What is the prosecution hiding from us? What are they not giving us? And in the end, what would happen? The defense is going to sum up and say, where was Michael Cohen? So he had to come. The idea here with that diminishing returns is keep it tight, keep it simple, keep it on course and get him off the stand. All right, Anthony, one of the things that as a prosecutor I used to hate was not being able to respond if there was a press case or the defense was in the news, basically parroting whatever narrative they wanted the public to have. As you know, prosecutors right. can't really talk a whole lot. What are your thoughts about how they're responding in the courtroom to what Donald Trump is doing in the public? Well, I will tell you, prosecutors, I think they understood the assignment and they continue to bring the receipts, uh, Charles. And I think it's very important to note that they are doing this in a way that the jury can understand it. That's the most important group of people in this case. And so I'm really impressed that the narrative, the narrative arc that they um, have laid out inside the jury, uh, inside of the uh, inside of the courtroom for the jury. Um, I will say one other thing, what struck me the most about today's testimony, picking up on what Hugo said, is how much of it we have already heard from other witnesses and what we've seen in evidence. Um, and really the motivation for uh, this effort here to keep this information uh, out of the hands uh, of the public. The other important thing that I just want to uh, make clear to your viewers, and Hugo touched on this a little bit, is that Michael Cohen put Donald Trump in the room at another critical moment today. This is with, I think, his exhibit 35. This is when uh, Alan Weisselberg, um, importantly, wrote out on a piece of paper how the reimbursement scheme would, uh, would, would work throughout 2017 for legal services to be performed um, and not uh, as opposed to this uh, simply being a, a reimbursement hush money payment. So uh, a lot of things uh, happened today. They really moved this case forward. The real test will come tomorrow uh, or whenever cross-examination begins. 
Susan, before we get to the cross-examination that Anthony was just referencing, I want to ask you about Donald Trump's newfound posse. He has had a number of folks show up, uh, essentially having his back and making statements out of court. Last week, it was Senator Rick Scott from Florida. Today, we saw a number of folks who were there, including J.D. Vance and others. What do you make of the timing of these people showing up, and do you think that it has any impact on the scale whatsoever for Donald Trump, the candidate? Well, that's right. That's the that's the amazing and sort of really extraordinary thing about this case is that it is not just uh, to the jury and in a courtroom that the case is being pitched, but of course, how is that going to break through or not break through to the American people in the middle of this election? And you know, as always, the, it's the spectacle that really still continues to blow me away of so many Republicans playing for that uh, audience of one Donald Trump. Uh, they're you know basically out there auditioning for vice president. President auditioning for roles in uh, you know the future Trump administration. I think uh, Vivek Ramaswamy is planning to come there tomorrow. You had two senators in the courtroom today, J.D. Vance and Tommy Tuberville. Uh, you know you had various of, of Trump's uh, sons at, at various points. And what are they doing? They're essentially sucking up to dad sucking up to the boss, uh, you know, essentially trying to amplify, trying to say, well, he's been gagged, so we're going to make his points for him. And I, I just, I think it's all very telling. The question I have is how much are Americans really paying attention to this at this point as a political spectacle or not? Do they think they already know uh, whether they're for Donald Trump or against Donald Trump? I, I just don't know if it's breaking through. A motley MAGA crew has been at his side, and I anticipate that there will be more to come, uh, to Susan's point. But, Jeremy, let's go back in court. So, Michael Cohen is a guy who obviously was on the inside of the Trump organization. And today we heard the name of another insider as far as the Trump uh, organization is concerned, but someone who wasn't there, Alan Weisselberg. All right. Now, both Cohen and Weisselberg at some point have done jail time because of Donald Trump. What do you make of the prosecution's handling of that? And do you think that Weisselberg's absence somehow could come back to bite the prosecution or be a problem for them? I'll answer this in reverse. I don't think it's going to be a problem because Weisselberg is in jail and Weisselberg is really a soldier. And kind of sticking with what we were just discussing about who was there outside of court, we have senators showing up. There's something called loyalty. And we learn that Donald Trump puts first and foremost, not necessarily ethics mm -hmm. or not necessarily good business you know, uh, skill set. It's about loyalty. Weisselberg was not going to come on that stand and sell out Donald Trump. True or not, he wasn't going to say anything bad. That's why he's doing time. That's why he was accused of and ultimately convicted of lying himself. So I don't think that not having him there is going to adversely impact the case. I think if the prosecution does their job and, again, keeps it tight, they're going to be okay. But this loyalty theme is really out playing out outside the courtroom and inside the courtroom. But let's stay with that for a minute. Sure. You, you talked about the notion of loyalty. Is it possible that Michael Cohen was just a little too loyal for a little too long in terms of his utility? for the prosecution in this case as far as the amount of time that he spent as Donald Trump's henchman and underling and fixer? Well, we've, again, discussed this before. You're not going to get the bad main player. You're not going to get the highs ahead of the criminal enterprise or the drug dealer unless you get the people who are really tight around him who are doing his dirty deeds or her dirty deeds. That's Michael Cohen here. You know, he, the Trump is not accused, obviously, of those, of those more salacious, evil things, but that's who he is. And, you know, I think that... that you know, the big fear, again, is just keeping him from going rogue. But why would, why would common sense tell you that someone like Michael Cohen, who I believe they said made $525,000 a year, would take out a home equity line of credit to avoid his wife finding out, because you'd get in trouble with his wife, that's pretty serious, and pay $130,000 pre-tax, post-tax dollars? He had to think it's getting paid back. There is an agreement in there. It's common sense. It's math almost. So I think he's okay.